when I took the job in 1987, uh, we were putting less than 7,000 people a game in here in, in, a, in an 18,000 seat arena, 17,000. And it was not good. It wasn't fun to go to the games. Our team wasn't good. We couldn't win. And, uh, you know, all kinds of things were wrong. Uh, uh, our alumni, who should be our greatest salesmen, were uh, not welcome at the building. You know, it was just, uh, we weren't in the community. Uh, we were just a, a franchise stuck out here waiting for some hangman to come along and take it somewhere else, you know. And, uh, and so we made the approach, hope, hopefully it's the right one, as it turned out to be the right one, that we'd have to build slowly and start adding some, some players. And uh, uh, in those days, you could do it through the draft. It still took some time <clears throat> to accomplish, but you could do it somewhat through the draft because we had lots more. Today, I think there's eight rounds, but in the old days, we used to have up to 18 rounds. And so you could catch players later on in their, <clears throat> in their, in the draft that uh, maybe had a chance to play, and that's where our scouts turned out to be very good. We were without first-round picks for a couple of years, and so we started picking a few things off. And uh, in 1989, uh, uh, I believe it was, uh, I think we uh, picked Trevor Linden first. And, uh, you know, he was going to be a cornerstone. He moved right in as an 18-year-old, played in the National League. But in that uh, very next uh, year, I think it was the next year, we were able to get the Russians to come in. And that caught some attention. But it also helped us grow. Igor Larionov was one of the smartest players I'd, I'd ever played, uh, coached, and, and been around. And he had a lot to do with the growing of, of the team. Then we reached out, we needed, you know, we, we'd get pushed around by, uh, we had some decent players, but we'd get pushed around by other teams. And that was that 80s time when you had the goofballs out there and, and the only thing they did was go and try to intimidate and get sent out by their coaches and that. So I went to the, to the uh, Memorial Cup in Hamilton that year and there on uh, the Quebec team was this uh, big native boy. And he made a difference uh, in what happened. If I'm not mistaken, the Quebec League uh, won the Memorial Cup that year. And, but Gino impressed me because I didn't want just a goofball where you pushed it out on the ice and said, go fight. If I, I, I respect fighting. There's a place for it. But it needs to be somewhat spontaneous. Uh, spontaneous. And uh, Gino could recognize he could good enough player. I always said I won't carry one that can't play. And there were lots of them out there. Uh, but I will, if there's a chance that a kid could play and give some minutes uh, and look after, uh, you know, helping the, the little bit better players that you have, he'd be the right guy. So when it came time to, uh, for our pick, I forget what round it was, but Gina was still there and we took him. And it didn't take long for him to keep progressing. And he was surprisingly good uh, at understanding the game. Uh, he's, he's, he, he has a good brain. And uh, uh, so that was really how it came about. I was looking for some big muscle that could, uh, could play. And Gino, we didn't know as an 18-year-old or a 19-year-old in the draft whether how long he'd take to get to the National League, but it was only a year and a half or so before he was uh, called up. And, and then I started to coach, I think, the year after he arrived. Well, again, certainly I didn't want him fighting just to fight, but he had to start to prove himself too. And I, and I don't specifically remember the game, but... Uh, each of the situations wasn't as if he said, I got to go fight this guy now. Um, it was uh, in attempting to uh, protect some guys. By that time, I'd acquired Ronning and Cortnell and Mameso and a few other guys that, that uh, were pretty good players. And Gino recognized that we were playing somebody that uh, was pretty tough. So he said, okay, that's where I play. And I, I was playing him. 
uh, or may maybe it was McCammon at the time, he was going to establish a name for himself. And uh, a lot of young guys coming in the game went after the existing supposed tough guys. I remember at the end of my career, the number of young guys that wanted to challenge me uh, when my fighting days were long gone. But uh, because I could, you know, uh, fight, the, the, I was the guy to challenge. And uh, so some 21-year-old was coming after a 34-year-old, and uh, they had to figure out how to look after all these young whippersnappers, you know. And uh, but Gino became more than a whippersnapper. He be, he became a player, and especially after Pavel arrived. Exactly, and that is where you establish respect, and if the other or fear, if the other team, you know that. We used to call it a nuclear deterrent, uh, you know, from back in the Cold War days, uh, where if you had one on your bench, you knew, and I mean, that's the role I played, the Orlin Curtain back. Uh, you could go to a number of guys that could play the game, but they could also, if, uh, if uh, someone was taking liberties with your teammates, you step up and you, and you, you do the job, you know. And so in Gino's case, he had to establish himself as the next guy that could play but if you're going to play beyond the rules or beyond the rules as I see them and try to intimidate our players into not playing well, then you're going to have to deal with me. And he had no problem doing that. Yeah, I always felt like, you know, as, as I mentioned, his previous coach to me would have been a guy that come out of the Philly organization and, and uh, they had the reputation. Now, I also come out of the Philly organization, but... I tried to change how things were being played from Shiro to my own regime there, you know. And that's when I had made up my mind. I wasn't just going to carry a, a guy. Like, I had a guy like Holmgren on the team. and They never played Holmgren. He just sat there. So when I came there, I went to Paul and said, uh, Paul, <clears throat> we're going to find out if you can play. If you can't play and you're just going to sit there, then I, I don't want you, uh, you know. So let's figure out if you can play. That same mantra uh, played for me through uh, with Gino. I told him, look, you'll get a chance to play on the ice because I really didn't believe that they should not play. They, they needed to have reason to be part of the team. Part of this reason was making sure that nobody was picking on Cliff Ronning or uh, you know some of the players that were your little scorers. Um, <clears throat> And, and they had to understand, there's a time, and I'll leave it in your hands to figure out the time, but if you need to talk to me about, should I be going now, should I not be going now, then we'll, we'll straighten that out, because uh, I just don't want you getting off the bench uh, and fighting because the, uh, the guy opposite you was supposedly their tough guy. I could care less whether you fought their tough guy anymore, once you've established yourself. <clears throat> But he had to establish himself. He had to get that respect out there, and as I said, and the possible fear, because it, it would change how the other team would play, knowing that Gino just didn't sit on the bench. And they got warned, oh, Gino's on the ice, leave him alone. Don't do. I wanted him out there so that he took a, a fairly regular shift, and they'd have to be looking, well, Gino's on the ice again. And uh, so let's make sure that uh, uh, nothing bad happened, so he really became effective then. He didn't have to fight every night, but he did. He did go through that that initial uh, reputation uh, challenge. Uh, again, I didn't just sit him there and say, "Okay, now go out and get everybody stirred up." But as as I moved him around from line to line, he would understand that that uh, part of his playing is to be a physical player. Like, it's not just about fighting. Fighting is a happenstance in our game. But being physical, making sure you're a good forechecker, making sure that around the net you're not giving anything up. And we actually even played Gino on defense a few times. Uh, so he, he had a good understanding of the game. And also, uh, his coaches probably taught him well about what his responsibilities were and that when he's out there, he needed to be first in. And later on, he'd look over and see who's playing with him and uh, decide, I need to be the four-checker on, on, uh, for this line. 
You know, if you had Cortinal and, and Ronning, neither one of those four checked a great deal, but if you put Gino out there, he was going to put pressure on the puck, and these two would sit there and wait, and, and Gino could play well enough where he could get an angle, to cause turnovers, and scare the heck out of some people, you know, that uh, didn't want the puck anymore, and they throw it away. Because that, no matter how you cut it, fear is still part of this game. Well, where he led mostly, he was fairly quiet. Uh, I'm sure he, he uh, was taught to keep his mouth shut and respect the the older players and uh, um, but where his leadership came in was that like I, I think leadership is a revolving situation you've got 20 players that somewhere along the way it's your turn to lead or your turn to step back and your team needs to recognize who's who's leading in this particular thing and there's lots of times that they let Gino take take that role uh, because they understood that this re revolving, if, if now, uh, let's say he forechecked and the, he, uh, they got a penalty. So now I send out the power play guys. It might be Gino. Like I used him sometimes later on in it. He'd go to the front of the net, depends on how we changed our, our power play, but I was never afraid to use him in those situations. And, uh, and so that's how he'd be a, a leadership. Otherwise he was fairly quiet. Uh, he was respectful. He was always respectful of his coaches. And uh, he wanted to get better. And he wanted to, above all, uh, he wanted to be a meaningful part of this hockey team. And as a coach, I wanted the same thing. I, I tried to get where we had uh, a team that kept the puck, not give it up. And a lot of guys you get, they're they're taught to put it in and chase it, you know, and uh, give up the possession of the puck. I never liked that style of hockey. So, so I think that's where I help them uh, is uh, keep the thing until you have a play or if you have no play, the play I want is laying the puck uh, to a safe spot. And he could pick that up. I mean, uh, I'm not so sure where I helped him in terms of uh, his growth as a player. Uh, but I do know he worked hard. Uh, he wanted to be good. I think a lot of it had to do that I just didn't leave him on the bench. He had a, he had a position with our team. And I don't care if you're a player. Uh, you might only get a little role, but if you're involved, then you feel like you're making a contribution. And the worst thing in life is, is to feel you don't mean anything to anybody, you know. And so he knew he meant something to someone. And like I said later, that... It even took a more quantum leap later on when Pavel came. A strange mix. You wouldn't have guessed necessarily that those two would come together as friends. Um, Pavel, of course, was learning a language, wasn't very fluent. Uh, Gino, he has got a big heart. He cares about his teammates, even when they hurt him. Uh, you know, the, and the that happens in... Uh, all kinds of teams. If they hurt you in a way that uh, demeans you or doesn't give you credit for being a good team member, then that's the stuff you don't, you, you remember a long time. Uh, with Pavel, uh, Gino recognized that uh, there was still a bit of a redneck attitude amongst our team as we started to get better. That uh, if you're from Europe, that, uh, you know, if you're from Russia, that's really bad because we hate the Russians, you know, uh, when they, they were behind the Iron Curtain days. Uh, um, if you're a native, maybe that's not so good either. Uh, so I think that brought them together as a sort of a, a natural sort of, uh, we're different, but we face issues that are similar. And uh, they were a mutual support of society, I think, in a lot of ways. And that's, that's how that, that uh, growth in the friendship kept going. And like you say, they're friends to this day. And uh, it's a good friendship, again, based on love, based on trust, um, and uh, certainly respect. Pavel, you know, Pavel didn't have to worry if Gino was on the ice, uh, nobody was going to uh, do anything real bad to him or 
if they did it, they weren't going to get away with it for long. And then once they're, they're not his team, even though, uh, and, and Pavel's gone too, so both of them went at the, just pretty much the same time. And, uh, but their bond didn't change. Uh, the bond to the group that was here uh, was gone too. You know, they, they no longer owed it to this dressing room. They owed it to their new dressing room. Now they went separate ways, one to Florida, one to the Islanders. Uh, but in Gino's mind, my friend was still someone I'd protect and I'd protect him uh, all my life, you know. So to me, that's what that was. It, it's well beyond because, I mean, I've changed teams myself. And while I do have great respect and even, uh, you know, some very strong emotional feelings for some of my teammates, uh, time's different. And uh, with uh, those two, it, it didn't change. They were, they were, well, as we'll see this weekend, he's uh, very much still attuned to his friend. For me, he would internalize it. You know, he's not, he wasn't going to raise the dust. He wasn't going to run to me and complain. Um, he still would back up his teammates. Uh, maybe uh, when he was with the Islanders, he'd, he'd uh, have already ticked a couple of names back in Vancouver that he might, uh, that might have treated him poorly. But uh, it's an emotional cut, and, and that's where Gino's so professional. He, he internalized it and dealt with it because he was a professional and wanted to make sure that he was making his best contribution to the team and sometimes you got to block those things off. I mean, that's what good athletes do. They block those things out. All of us have trouble in life some way or another, whether through cuts from your teammates, whether family situation, whatever it might be. A lot of us struggle through that. When it comes game night, you got to park it. And Gino was very good at doing that. If you want to go back to my day in the 60s and, uh, and 70s, and then earlier than that, there was only six teams, and you didn't even tell anybody about being hurt because they'd send you to the minor leagues. They didn't have to let any other team get a crack at you. You had no place to go, uh, so you'd, you wouldn't, you'd play hurt. And that became an expectation as we started to add teams and change uh, the numbers we had. And uh, uh, as the collective bargaining agreements came, come and changed, the, uh, the, the concept of uh, playing hurt still existed in some players. Some players would say, I am hurt and I'm not going tonight, but other ones would tape up the, any way they could and make sure that they were still going to be part of their team and they could do whatever they were being asked to do out there. That comes from talking yourself into certain things. And there's no question that Gino uh, played very physically and he answered the bell and he fought all the tough guys and he uh, he sacrificed physically more than a lot of other players and uh, you pay I mean uh, anybody who played a physical game as you get older your knees don't work your hips don't work maybe your head doesn't work we're finding out incredible things about concussion and uh, you don't even need to be a tough guy to get concussion nowadays. And, uh, uh, you know, if you're a guy like Gino, there's probably a, a number of times that he got whacked and didn't know whether he was Arthur or Martha for a while. And uh, then as soon as he could, he'd a little smelling salts and out, out he'd go again. So we don't know the whole story yet. And... Uh, I'm glad the league, the Players Association, and the Alumni Association are spending time trying to figure out uh, <clears throat> what can they do about the serious injuries that happen in the game today. Because we don't seem to be making it any different. You know, it's uh, still lots of head injuries. So we see suspensions nearly every night now, and I guess that might be part of the answer is the, the suspension to alter uh, performance in, in some desired way. And uh, it probably comes a time where you say, maybe guys like Gino or guys like myself 
wouldn't be able to play the game because the rules are totally changed, you know. And uh, we don't know that yet, but we know that uh, there is concerns. We've seen it in football that uh, they're lining up to get workers' comp. That'll probably happen in hockey as well. And some players maybe deserve it, you know, the, from the punishments they took over the years. We've found that uh, sometimes it doesn't even take a, big, a blow to the head to cause uh, the, the head injury. That a, a hard body check can rattle the brain uh, inside the, the skull, which would cause or, or do something with the, the nervous system down the, the back. So that's why they're studying it. They don't have all the answers. And uh, hopefully we'll find some answers so that we can guide these players correctly so that we don't have situations uh, where we have to run out and find medical help or even more uh, to uh, you know, have them live, live a proper life. Well, I, I, no, I can't tell you about one. Um, but I, I, I sure remember this place going nuts uh, when he uh, uh, was given a penalty shot and scored. I mean, it was just one of those uh, magical moments. And uh, so I, I remember that magic. I, I just remember, uh, I don't have any funny stories about Gino because as I mentioned, you know, players hide it from their coaches. They don't want to be seen uh, any different. They, they'll want you to see a certain uh, image uh, of who they are. And so they'll, their private life, they'll, they uh, they like to hold to their own. So, and I wasn't one that was going to chase them around. I mean, uh, I try to treat them all with respect. Some of them cheated uh, on curfews and things like that. And uh, when whenever that happened, which I don't think was often, I, you'd you'd uh, uh, either park them, sit them out, or uh, challenge them in a sense that uh, you are sinning against not me, you're sinning against your teammates. And if that's what you want to do, then perhaps we better find another place for you to play. But I don't think, uh, you know, guys, guys pretty much honored uh, that. And when you have, uh, like I say, you always have someone that transgresses. But uh, in Gino's case, uh, I think he was pretty much straightforward. You know what? I wasn't uncomfortable. I mean, he he uh, deserved it because he was the one that was penalized, uh, fouled against. And uh, you know, we well, we used to do penalty shot a lot, uh, just uh, at the end of practices and that sort of thing. And Gino wasn't the worst on our team by any means. And uh, uh, I I uh, felt that he just come over and instead of talking to me, he went down and talked to Pavel, who, could, who knew how to score. And uh, then uh, went back out and, and, like I say, he was able to pull off. I don't think it was a shift. I think he, uh, maybe a little uh, head shake, but uh, the, I think he shot it in the net, into the net. But what I do remember is this place was thunderous. You know, it was, uh, uh, everybody was so happy for him including his teammates on the bench. Uh, all of us were so happy that uh, this uh, special situation turned out right for him that uh, it was a special moment. Yes, uh, he was part of a lot of good things that were happening. Uh, as I said, uh, Lyndon came along, a good young guy that would become the captain. Uh, we had Larry Knopf come in and give us a little bit of the... We made a big deal with uh, St. Louis that flushed us out and made us deeper. And then Gino come along really unexpectedly. We, we knew he'd, he might be able to play in the league, but we didn't know how long that would take. And he surprised everybody by, well, uh, what caught his attention for McCammon especially was that he wasn't afraid to take on anybody uh, at all. He was going to prove who he was. And if that's what he had to do to play in the National Hockey League, he was going to do it. And so you're right, these, uh, no one player makes a team, never has, never will. But if you've got some supporting pegs, uh, then each of us can be better. 
And uh, to me, that's what, what happened. A group of guys come in. Some of them were toss-aways. Some of them were initial picks like Pavel and, uh, and Gino and, and Trevor. And uh, all of a sudden, they looked around and they said, you know, together we can be pretty good. And that's what brought us along. And, and Gino was that guy that we didn't have, you know, that one that could understand how to play, but could also understand how he fit in to be the enforcer, if, if you will, and uh, protect, protect his teammates. And what, you know, in, in spite of what uh, the discussions are all the time, a lot of people say, well, they don't like fighting. Guess when they stand up, when a goal is scored or there's a fight going on. So explain it to me. And so Gino uh, was a guy that attracted, uh, he helped us sell. He helped us get people back in the building. They wanted to come and see Pavel. They wanted to come and see Gino. And there's lots that they, they could be anybody. But we had several guys that now they were attractions. And uh, and certainly Gino was one of them. Cool. I just have one more thing I just want to check. Uh, if you can tell me one thing that you think Gino has taught you as a coach. Well, um, what has always amazed me is his his sense of loyalty uh, to people that treated him with some respect along the way. Uh, he was a a great competitor. He was he's smarter than people thought he was. He's very intelligent. Um, but I, I liked his humility. He didn't have to be the kingpin. He didn't have to be uh, loved by the crowd. He liked it, but uh, it wasn't. He didn't start the game getting ready so that the crowd would love him like a few that I can have coached in the past. Um, what he wanted to do was his job right. And so that humility about himself, to me, showed his ability as a leader when his time to lead came. And it came fairly often until he became established as an important cog to this hockey team and the one that physically we were looking for. That's it. Good. Thank you so much. So all we're going to do is we're going to do 30 seconds of uh, silence that we just...